Now, I was 10 years old. <clears throat> now, the 10th of May, 1940, is when the war started. And I was 10 years old. I came from a family of three, my mom and dad. I had a brother and a sister. My sister was two and a half years older than me. And my brother was six and a half years younger than me, so I was the middle one. And uh, <clears throat> the 10th of May, we lived right in Brussels. <clears throat> and that's Belgium. Belgium. The cannon started the fire, the German planes started to come to see they had invaded Poland. So they thought they would invade Belgium and go into France and Luxembourg and invade. The Hitler's ideal was that he was going to conquer Europe. And he started over there in Poland, which he did. There was a lot of atrocities going on in Poland, but it, it didn't continue into Belgium and France and that. So the 10th of May, <clears throat> the war started. The Germans started to bomb the railways and all the means of transportation. And the government well, had a terrible time because we didn't have to. See, Belgium <clears throat> is a small country. It's considered like the size of Maryland, Maryland, and it's a small state. But Belgium has 11 million people. So Brussels, where I lived, Brussels just alone had a million people. So anyway, the government, Belgium government, when Germans started to bomb everything, you know, the government came to the younger people, like my dad and the younger man, they said, my idea for your people to evac evacuate, evacuate to France so the German, you, because the German will probably take you, pick you up and make you fight with them. So my dad got scared, so my dad had a car. So we loaded in the car and took over and evacuated with thousands of people. It was bumper to bumper to go to France. And it took us days, days to get there because it was bumper to bumper, you know. In the meantime, there were air raids in between the evacuation. You would have to get out of the car, hide yourself, and try to prevent yourself from the shrapnel of the, the, the bombs, you know. So we ended up <clears throat> to France, the southern part of France. And we stayed there for several months until they told us that it was safe to go back to Belgium. The German had invaded Belgium and we would have to deal with German, Germans. But the idea was that if we minded our business, we didn't have anything to, to be scared of. But it was a, there was a lot of restrictions because every, about 10 o'clock at night, everything, all windows, everything that had lights had to be eliminated and covered with dark, Blinds and windows. Yeah, because of the air raids. They didn't want, when the planes came over, they didn't want the Americans to know that this was the place of Belgium because in the meantime, they were fighting back and forth. So anyway, when we returned to, <clears throat> to Belgium, we tried to live a halfway normal life, you know, but everything was rationed. We, by the time we got back from France, which we spent several times, several months there, uh, everything was depleted at the store. There was nothing to be bought. People had just rushed and bought everything out of the store. So they issued us stamps on everything for bread, for butter, for meat, for everything. For when you try to feed five people on very few stamps, it was hard. But somehow we managed because my dad you had money at the time that he could buy food black market. You know what black market is. You and I remember is? my dad mm -hmm. paying ten dollars for a pound of butter. Oh, so black market is like the under underground, like secret. So you would buy it kind right. of secretly. Yeah. So anyway, talking about underground, we had uh, <clears throat> my dad had a workshop in the back, and we rented the whole house. We lived on the main floor, and then it was two floors 
about that we ran it. But we didn't know that they were Jewish people that we ran it. So that didn't go very good because you know what they did to the Jewish people. So they came and uh, arrested. We didn't know at the time. They came, well, one night in the middle of the night, this was kind of scary. They had teeth, German had, they called them the black shirt, the SS, the, uh, oh, what did they call it, the Gestapo. They, we were in bed, sleep in the middle of the night. The Gestapo came in, I think there was like two or three guys, I think there was two or three. And they opened the bedroom door and they put a gun to my dad's head like this. And my dad woke up scared to death, was wondering what was going on. And he said, there's Jewish people living in this house. We want them. And my dad didn't know they were Jewish, you know. So anyway, the one I heard the Gestapo come in, he was just like a cat, just on alert all the time, you know. And he escaped at the top of the roof. But his mother was in there. And she was a heavy set woman. And they picked her up. And uh, later on he learned that she was gassed and put in the oven and all that. But the other ones were also arrested and we never did see any more of them until after the war. Only one came back. The other one was, we never know what happened to him. The one that escaped through the ceiling, did he come back? Did he make it? Well, he escaped, you know, and he was later on, he came down and he told my dad, he said, we're working for the underground of the Russian. He was actually going for the Russians. You know, they were on our side. Yeah. And uh, my dad said, you know, he said, we can't have you here. My whole family's in jeopardy, you know, if you stay here. So he left because they had picked up his mom, you know. So he, later on, he got picked up and was sent. See, they, they hauled all the Jewish people in those big cattle truck, just wooden truck, you know. And he, he had kept a, a knife in the, in the bottom of his shoe. And somehow, he, while he was being, was going to be transferred to one of the camps in Auschwitz or whatever, Buchenwald, he didn't know where, he kept the woods enough so he could escape. And on a big turn, when the, when the train turned, he said, he escaped, he jumped out. And he came, he came back and, and told us, you know, what had happened. And then he left and we never did hear any more about him. So we, we, knew, we didn't know what, you know. But at the same time, we didn't know that my dad was, and he had a friend, they were both working for the underground, for the Americans, you know, and they were hiding guns. And my dad was helping him and he was hiding some guns in between his wood. My dad, he was, he, he worked with the wood. He had a, a shop where he made cab, uh, furniture and all that. So anyway, <clears throat> then after that, we tried to live a normal life as much as we could, you know, until, uh, until the, the Americans came in and they lived with Belgium. But in the meantime, I remember one time we didn't have any food. And my dad say, he said, Janine, let's you and I rent a bicycle. Let's go to the country and buy some food from the farmers. So my dad and I, we pedaled the bicycle. See, on the back of the bicycle, there's a little basket. Yeah, so you could put stuff in. We pedaled 50 miles to the country, my dad and I. 50? 50 miles. We arrived there at night, and we, of course, we bought, we bought some, uh, some wheat. And I came back with a great big sack of wheat in the back, and my dad had butter and other things, you know. And we came back the next day. So my dad, in his workshop, he installed a little grinder to, to grind the wheat. So I put a scarf on my head because it's, you know, the, the wheat, you know, it blows kind of flour on you. So anyway, I would put the grain in the, in the little grinder, you know, the wheat, and it would grind. And then we'd put it in a big sifter for the peeling of the grain, you know, and then my mom, and then we had at the time we were raising my dad. At one time, my dad had eighty-three rabbits. 
and we used that for meat because meat was rationed, you know. So he would we would boil the peeling from the grain, and and would make some stuff with it, and he would make balls and feed it to the rabbits. It was good food for them. And then with the flour, my mom would mix it, and it would be, of course, whole wheat bread, you know, because it wasn't really white. And that's how we survived on a lot of things. Did you have a garden? No, no, no we don't garden. have gardens. No, not in the city, you know. But you had room for your rabbits. Yes. Yes, okay. in the, there was a place where we had hydra. My mom used to raise the most beautiful hydrangea. She had them all over. And then my dad was a builder, of course, so he had built all those cages against the wall, and we had rabbits all over. And did he sell rabbits during that time? No, we ate them. You needed them all. I love rabbits. <gasps> it's a delicate lesson over there, you know. So it's a, So we did okay that way. So that was, and then we couldn't get potatoes. So are you familiar with rutabaga? Mm -hmm. Okay, we had a lot of that and my mom would make a, a yellow, a white sauce with it. And you know, it was pretty good. And fruit was, was a ration, you know, of course, you know. And chocolate, we were a lot, I think, one bar a, a month, you know, each one, one bar a month. <laughs> and uh, so we survived until, and then, when the, when, when, well, Belgium, she surrendered because uh, we didn't have the, the material it's to fight and, and, the, and the people, you know, to fight. So the king surrendered and France turned against us. So when we evacuated to France, we were not treated very well because they were mad against Belgium because the king surrendered, you know, and he did the right thing. Our men were getting killed and it was just, you know. So anyway, so I got, um, I brought a picture here of me, my friend and my sister. We were, I had just been to my piano lesson and if you look on the side, there was a German officer walking on the boulevard right down there. So during that time, you were free to come and go and go to piano lessons and right. kind of live your normal see, life. My dad uh, had a car, but we couldn't get gasoline. So my dad's car was parked in the garage for four years. Then after the war, when they were liberated, Belgium, they asked my dad, since you have a car, if we give you the, the gasoline, will you repatriate? A lot of our soldiers that are free now, you know. So my dad did that, and he was glad to do it because he hadn't driven for four years, you know. So, but as long as, I'll say one thing, they didn't bother German, they didn't bother us, as long as we minded our business. We have to be very careful. A lot of the girls, you know, thought some of those soldiers were good looking and they went with them. But after the war, they took all those girls, shaved their heads right off, and just they were not treated very well. Who did that? The people. What people? Anybody that were on the street, the, the, the people that didn't even know, but they knew they had been with the Germans. So they just grabbed them and shaved their heads. <laughs> Just people, anybody. They just knew who they were. Oh, because they didn't like them dating the German soldiers. Right, right. It was like against, you know. So anyway, you know, you know. I want to show you the pictures of the furniture that my dad made. That's the kind of furniture he made. So tell well, them about how your dad sold furniture to the Germans oh, yes. underground. Okay. It's getting there. Oh. And... Uh, and was he able to work during the war? Was he able to still have an income and life kind of went on normally? Or well, he... he did. And a lot of the furniture that he made, the Germans would come in his store. See, my dad had a workshop in the back and in front was his, uh, where he sold the furniture. The Germans came in and said, we need to have this, 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 and that. 
and you didn't tell the German all because you're German, I can't build that. So he did, and my dad made a lot of money. So after the war, the Belgian government, they wanted everybody that had sold to the German prove how they made their money. My dad didn't. So what they did, they just took everything that he had in the bank. Because they would have confiscated the, um, the money that would have been made from the Germans. Mm -hmm. And because he couldn't prove it was only this amount, they took it all. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's terrible. And they changed the currency. So anybody that had made money through the German, they just, they took everything oh. my dad had. And then did he start over and keep building furniture and re well, rebuild? He, he did, but it was hard, you know. But he did, he did what he could, I guess, you know, so. But that, that was his profession. Yes, made She furniture. said he kind of, um, after that, he kind of just lost his zest for work and life and, you know what I mean? Yeah, he lost his, you know, he thought, what's the use, you know? But you know what they did to the German? I mean, to the, to the Jews. And after, after the American went to Germany and took over, the, Germ, uh, the Americans made the Germans dig there was piles of bodies of the Jewish. So the Americans made some of the soldiers dig trenches and bury each one individually. And I've got pictures of that. And my dad was one of those American soldiers that went in and made him dig This was one graves. of the Jews right there, and he came back. But look, this is, this is the, This is the bodies in the back of the truck rock. Okay, this is the grave that the Americans made the German soldier dig individually. See, this is the bodies, look. And was this in Brussels? No, that's in the, that was where the Jews were in Germany, in those concentration camps. So did, so you got these pictures from your husband? Yes, he, he okay. took them. Yeah, he okay. took them. And see, because this was Hitler, and he picked yeah. it up because there was German writing. And I asked a German lady to translate that, and she said, I can't, that's the old script. Oh. And she couldn't translate it. Hmm. But see, there's a, like all the bodies in the back. And this is where they were put in. That's a, that's a Jewish body. That's, I think it does look like it's firm, doesn't it? They'll pass them around. So at the at see. the end, can I take a few pictures of these with my camera? Oh, Are absolutely. You okay with that? Yeah, we have two or three of those pictures enlarged. I think oh. Linda and I we just had those enlarged. Oh. And then, <clears throat> see, I was 14 years old when the war ended. And I used to spend my summer at the country, which was about 50 miles from, from Brussels. Um, so my aunt raised chicken, so we took fresh eggs. The, the Americans were in camps, you know, parked out. You know, and anywhere that they could, we would take them fresh eggs <laughs> to the Americans. They loved that, you know, because <laughs> they were used to ration and can ration and all that. And they, they loved us for that, you know. And then I met this guy right here. He was actually a blind date. That was <laughs> what he looked like when I met him. The one is an enlargement. So how old were you when you met him? I was 15. So and at 16, I was married. <laughs> and he was four years older, so he was 20. And why was he in Belgium? 
he was camping there. They they would transfer him. You know, first he was in he was in Paris and he was in the hospital. He was operating on for double hernia. And then they they transferred the whole group to Belgium, and uh, he camped there. You know. And did he have a job or or was it kind well, of a transfer? He was still in the service. See, he was. Uh, but what were they doing in Belgium? What did they do for? Just staying there. But, Taking care of the country, and then and were the Belgians fine with that? Were they fine having so many American troops oh, there? Oh, tickled to death. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he was when this was in Germany. He was policing a bridge, and a lady was walking across the bridge, and she was carrying this gun. And she was a that. German lady. Yes. And he didn't know, my husband didn't know she was going to get shot or what, but he took it away from her. That's the gun. Huh. And then, and then he brought home this big German, I think it still got some blood stain on it. Oh, okay. do you want, here, we can do it. Yeah, I, that's okay, I can do it. I'm do you want to help her hold it out? Yeah, you might want a picture of that. Oh, yeah. I'm recording you right now, so at the end I'll, I'll take a picture. Oh, wow. You've seen this. See all the, the stain on there? I'm sure it's... I'll push pause while you've got that out. <laughs> 